It's TV school time. WOI TV, in association with Iowa State Teachers College, presents another program in the Iowa TV School Time series, Landmarks in Iowa History. Today's topic, Lowell. Your teacher is Herb Hake of Iowa State Teachers College. Hello, boys and girls. That's an odd thing to be drinking coffee out of, isn't it? It's a cold day here today in Lowell so I thought I'd bring my coffee with me. But did you see what I used to bring it? This is a jug. You don't see many of these nowadays because most people carry their coffee in thermos bottles or canteens or things of that sort. But a little over 100 years ago, jugs like this were used for almost all liquids. That is because jugs could be made easily and with local materials and so today we are visiting an old pottery. See this building in the background? That is the old Melcher Pottery near Lowell, about two and a half miles east of Lowell. And Lowell is about 20 miles west of Burlington. This is a typical jug of the kind made in this pottery back here. You notice what we use for a stopper? Just a corn cob. That was another advantage of using jugs didn't have to have screw caps, just a corn cob would do. And since a corn cob is tapered, it would fit almost any kind of a jug. Well, in the early days, before glass was as common as it is today, and before there were tin containers, jars like this, or jugs, were made by the thousands for use in the homes and in the cities. And in this pottery back here, which was established in 1848 by David and Dennis Melcher, two men who came from Germany and who knew how to make jugs, in this pottery, thousands of jugs were made for molasses and for vinegar. There were milk pitchers made there, sauerkraut jars, pickle jars, all kinds of things of that kind. And because I think you would be interested in seeing how these jugs were made. I've asked my good friend Don Finnegan, who is a professor of ceramics at the Iowa State Teachers College, to actually throw a jug for you. Now this machine that you see here is a potter's wheel of the kind that was used in this old Melcher pottery. This is no longer used as a pottery now. It's a, a grain storage barn. And Mr. Ingram, who lives across the road over there, uses this as a barn. He has it full of corn and oats and hay and things of that sort. There are no potter's wheels inside there. So Mr. Finnegan and I brought this potter's wheel from Mr. Finnegan's laboratory on the campus of the Iowa State Teachers College in order to show you how a jug is thrown. This is a potter's wheel of the kind that might have been used in the old Melcher pottery. And the light is good outside here, otherwise we would go inside if there were room, which there isn't inside the old Melcher pottery because it's full of corn. So watch this, boys and girls. I think you'll enjoy seeing how a pot is made. Now that one is almost finished, isn't it, Mr. Finnegan? Yeah, just about ready to take off. Well, would you start over now mm -hmm. and show the boys and girls how you would start from the beginning? Well, set this one aside. All right. First of all, uh, what is the type of clay that you use here? This is a clay from that's mined in Iowa. There are several different clays that we use up at the college. Some from Fort Dodge and Sioux City. Uh -huh. It takes a special kind of uh, fine textured clay, does it? Well, or not just any kind of mud do. Well, it's not not quite right, but it uh, some clays, of course, are better than others, and the important thing in making pottery here at Melcher was that they had a source of clay that was close at hand that was suitable to make the kind of, of jugs and utensils mm -hmm. that they needed. That is, a pottery would usually be established at a point where there was a lot of natural mm -hmm. clay that could be mined conveniently and wouldn't have to be carried too far. And usually because the, the clay they used, they wanted to fire, bake it to very high temperatures, they uh, 
there were some clays that would work just for brick and wouldn't work for, for uh, making jugs now. Now, can you see this, boys and girls? You notice there's a turntable there, and down below there is a flywheel that Mr. Finnegan is kicking. And uh, as he kicks this heavy wheel down below, it makes the wheel up on top turn. Are all pottery wheels kicked like this, Mr. Finnegan? Well, most all of them that uh, have been used in the past have been basically of this type or else had a lever that you operated. I see. But I mean, are there any modern wheels that are controlled by a motor so that you don't have to do that kicking? Yeah, a, a wheel just like this can be fitted with a motor that saves you the exercise. But I suppose you can control the speed a little better if you kick it by foot. Well, this, with this very heavy wheel that we have here, it just keeps going without any further kicking. It'll roll pretty well by itself. All right. Now, yeah, just get the clay ready to sock it right down here in the center. And it has to be in the exact center, is that it? Well, it helps to start out with it pretty close in the center. Now, get the ball right in the center. Yes, I put water on here, that lubricates it so it'll slide through my finger. Really gets you messed up too, doesn't it? Yeah, but you don't mind. It's good clean clay, huh? That's right, good clean clay. Now is where I want it to go very fast so that I can get it in the center. Put pressure on the sides in order mm -hmm. to uh, pull it up, is that it? Yeah, it's, it's like squeezing a balloon. You push it in and down, and the clay just sort of rises up. Mm -hmm. And then I come up here and work it back down. It gets the clay finally worked in shape, ready to start working into the jug. You're breathing pretty hard, Mr. Finnegan. Is this hard work? Oh, if you kick this very often, you get, you get kind of used to it. <laughs> I should imagine you'd develop uh, real muscles at this kind of work. Well, I mean, a fairly good sized ball of clay here takes a considerably more to work with than a small ball. Now, I told the boys and girls that jugs were made in this general way in the old Melcher pottery. How many jugs do you suppose one man could make in the course of a day? Oh, if I make several hundred, they would... Several hundred? Sure. Uh, they would... Uh, probably specialize on one kind of shape that they're going to work with, it be a jug or a crock or, mm -hmm. or a storage jar. And then they just set up with a, a lot of balls of clay all the same and get ready to go and just keep carrying them out until they've exhausted their clay. I'm glad to see that this uh, jug is going to have an empty center. Yeah, it's I was afraid for a minute there was just going to be a solid <laughs> jug that you couldn't uh, carry anything in. Of course, it's only the hole in the jug that's really Useful. That's the important part of the jug, huh? <laughs> now, see, I have a hole down in there, and I'm now just squeezing and drawing the clay up so that it'll look eventually somewhat like this jug we have over here to the right. Yeah. Now, here's where you can see the wall come up. And this is all done with the fingers. Mm hmm. Are tools used for this purpose at all? I mean, can you use something besides your fingers on this? You don't need very many. Just your fingers pretty well. Why is that? That you can feel the yeah, you the, can the clay better? You can feel it a lot better than if you had some kind of tool because this is very important that you're able to feel the thickness of the wall and the kind of shape that you're making. Now you see, I'm gonna make, you can see for sure I'm making a jug because I'm bringing it in at the top here. Yeah.
Now, do you have a mental picture of how this is going to look when you get it finished? Or is this uh, just left to chance pretty largely? No, you have a pretty well an idea what you're going to to make because if we were going to make a, a bowl or something like that, we'd have to start working our clay out more or less into that shape. Mm -hmm. Although you can change it somewhat as you go along. What are you doing with the sponge there, smoothing out the finger marks? No, mostly I just get up the sponge here to bring water up and lubricate the surface of it. Mm -hmm. Now I can bring this top in here. Now, the sound hasn't gone dead on your TV set, boys and girls. I'm so interested in what's going on here that I'm just forgetting to ask Mr. Finnegan questions. The important thing is seeing how this is done, not listening to me talk. But if you have any questions, just speak up, boys and girls. That's a beauty. Now, is this the kind of a jug that will have a handle on it? Yeah, we'll eventually put a handle on it. Good, good. Let me just finish this neck up here. The corn cow about fit. That'll take a kind of a small corn cob, but of course we can get a small ear. Very nice shape. Now, as far as the old potters were concerned, the pioneer potters, the ones who used to work in this old Melcher pottery, do you suppose they had quite a bit of variety in the shapes of jugs, or were they pretty much standardized? All about the same size and the same shape. Well, I think they they made them in order to fit a certain uh, capacity. It might be a gallon or a quart or mm -hmm. whatever unit of measurement. Other than that, I think they they pretty well worked on a shape until they thought they had it the way they wanted, and then they just went ahead and made them all they alike, all just the like, like that. pretty well the same. Yeah. What are you doing there now? Well, we're trimming this down there at the bottom and removing that clay so that as soon as this dries, this plaster wheel that we have here will release from the clay and it'll be all finished on the bottom. We'll have to do any more than just sponge it just a little bit. Oh, I see. Uh, are you leaving those ridges that your fingers left? Or are yep. you going to smooth those down? No, those will pretty well remain in because old potters that used to work here would throw them with their fingers and, would, and uh, in most cases they'd leave the surface as you see right here just the way they made it instead yeah. of trying to smooth it up. Gave a handmade character to That's the whole right. jug. Well, that is very attractive. Now, what do you do about the handle? Aren't you going to uh, well, we can get ready push here. this out of shape if you put a handle on it? Well, we'll set it aside a little bit and let it let it stiffen up. Oh. Meantime, maybe we can make a handle here. I used to make these handles is to get a lump of clay like this and start pulling it. Oh into a shape like a handle. The way they usually do this, they'd make a, oh, many, many jugs like this and then 
I got tired of doing that, they'd make a bunch of handles to fit. Instead of coffee breaks, they, uh, yeah, they had a handle break. Right. Well, the point is, though, that uh, this can't be done immediately. I mean, you have to let mm -hmm. this body of the jug set. That's right, because it's dry it's, out a little. Although it looks like it's stiff on here, actually the clay is very soft and it could easily be pushed out of shape. Yeah. Now we can just take this handle and let it come down like this. It'll just take the shape and we can just cut it off here and stick it right to it as soon as it stiffens up a bit. I see. And we can set that aside to dry a little. We'll, we'll add that in just a little while. All right. Well, while we're waiting for that to dry, boys and girls, I think perhaps you might be interested in knowing just where Lowell is just where you can find this old Melcher pottery. Now, of course, if you happen to go there, you won't always find Mr. Finnegan sitting in front of it making a jug. The days of jug making at the old Melcher pottery are gone. Not a jug has been made in this old building for over 50 years. For about 50 years, this was a very thriving pottery. And about 25 people worked here every day, turning out thousands and thousands of jugs. But as glass became cheaper, and as tin containers became popular, jugs were not so much in demand. And about 50 years ago, the, the old pottery closed its doors, and the building is now used as a barn. But let me show you where Lowell is. Let's look at the map of Iowa here a minute. <coughs> I told you a moment ago that Lowell is about 20 miles west of Burlington. Here's Burlington on the Mississippi River. And Lowell is about 20 miles northwest, more west than north. And it's located on the Skunk River. At one time, this river was called the Chicago River, but there is a Chicago River in Illinois, so they didn't want to get it mixed up with that. So it's called the Skunk River now, and that means the same as Chicago River. I mean, Chicago and Skunk are the same in Indian. There is Lowell. Now that dotted line, that goes through Lowell, over here to the Des Moines River, is the old Agency Road, the oldest road in Iowa, which was established in 1841. And it was the road between Burlington, which was the territorial capital, and Agency. Agency City, as, as it was called then. This was the Sac and Fox Indian Agency, and a representative of the government, General Joseph Street, was stationed here and he ironed out all difficulties and disagreements between the white settlers and the Indians. Well, this road, you see, is not straight. It followed a ridge, but it passed right through Lowell. Here is Mount Pleasant, a little bit further northwest. And here is Agency, which is just on the other side of the river and about nine miles from Otumwa. Well, there is Lowell. If you go down on 218 through Mount Pleasant to Keokuk down here, you will come to a little gravel road about 12 miles south of Mount Pleasant, and you turn east on the gravel road and you come, after a little while, to Lowell. Let me show you some pictures of Lowell. Lowell is just a little town. Only about 80 people live there. But on the main street, which was originally the old Agency Road, there is this marker. And this marker says, Agency Road, oldest road in Iowa, established 1841 by the Territorial Legislature of Iowa. Marker erected in 1930 by the Get Together Women's Federated Club of Lowell, Iowa. And this little lady who is sitting here having her picture taken is Vicki Lynn Tebbs. She was very gracious about sitting down there while I took her picture last summer. Notice how she has her toes pointed down? She's going to be a model someday. You know why she points her toes down like that? That is to keep defeat from staring us in the face. That was a rouser, wasn't it? Well, this is Vicki Lynn Tebbs, and this is the Agency Road marker. Here's another stone which has historic significance. This stands near the river, near the Skunk River. It flows right back here. And you can see it from the bridge that crosses the river. This French Burr millstone marks the site of the first flour mill, built in 1838. Across the river was the first corn and sawmill, 
built in 1837. Built and operated by James C. Caudill and Hiram C. Smith, and placed by the James Harlan chapter of the DAR in 1930. That is a French Burr millstone. And this came across the Atlantic Ocean and was used originally as ballast in the old sailing ships. And then after the ship got to America, the stone was made into a millstone and was used over a hundred years ago. Here is a picture of the Skunk River. You see it isn't very wide. And this is all that remains of the dam that was used for these early mills. There is part of the old flour mill that used to stand over there on the Skunk River. And we come again to the old Melcher pottery. This is a different view than you see in the background. And here you can see that part of the building has been torn down. There was a gable that extended out this way, a sort of an L. And you see this was on the second floor. If anybody walked out of this door now, it would be a pretty long step to the ground. But that is, that is nailed shut. But this was the old Melcher pottery, and this part of the building still stands, and it will probably be there another hundred years, because this is all built of stone. And out here in the road is where we are today. Well, now I wonder if Mr. Finnegan has been able to put the handle on. About ready, Mr. Finnegan? Oh, it's about ready. Very good. Let's see what happens in putting on a handle. Is it uh, set hard enough, mm -hmm. you think? Yeah, it's, it's stiffened up. It might be a little too stiff. But we'll just cut this off. Well, what if it is too stiff? Will it just fall off well, after you set it there? You, can you uh, paste it on or something? We might have a little difficulty getting it to stick. But here where it's thick, it's a little softer. Might have a little bit of trouble down here. this were a little softer, we could just take this end that we have here and just bend it right around, which would be mm -hmm. much better. I had to cut some off. We well, can try and see how it fits. And the, the main form there is dry enough now so that it won't be yeah, no, pushed out of shape? Yeah. That's a nice here. sound. <laughs> a bongo drum. Sure, now the early putters here at uh, the old Melcher pottery didn't uh, think of using their jugs for bongo drums. Well, they could play music with it. I suppose they could. Jug music. That's right. You suppose that's where that started here at the old Melcher pottery? Well, maybe not here, but a similar place. We yes. can see how it fits. Very nice. And we've got her in shape there. We can take and uh, decide where we're going to put it and just kind of rough this up a little bit so it will stick better. Maybe we can roughen up this. You know, we can kind of moisten this and put a little, what you call slip on it. When clay is in a liquid form like this, you call it slip for some reason. I guess because slip? if it's on the floor and you step on it, that's about what'll happen. <laughs> S-L-I-P. Slip. Yeah. Slip. That's right. That'll make the joints work a little bit better together, especially that we have this, this clay is a little bit stiffer than, than it would be the best time to add it on. Mm -hmm. And here we'll just... With the clay stiff enough, we can push and get it stuck together. We're going to wiggle it around to get it stuck well. Then we can take our end here and see if we can get it stuck. A little more slip. Yeah, yeah. more slip. Now, Mr. Finnegan, um, what needs to be done before this jug is finished? I suppose this has to be fired now. It has to be put in the kiln? Well, first it'll have to be dried out. See, it's... Oh, how long even does it though, take to dry out? Even though this is, is stiffer than when we started, it's, it still has a lot of water in it to, oh. to be removed. It? In the old days, they'd just set the, all the jugs and pots outside. In the sun? Yeah, right in the sun, because they were using a... The clay that had a lot of sand in it, it would dry without cracking. Mm -hmm. And then after the it dries, it's put in a kiln then? After it's dry real well, they'll, they'll put it in a kiln, which was a... Oh, it looked like a great big beehive. Mm -hmm. Would maybe, maybe be 
30, 40 feet high. And they'd stack it with uh, thousands of these jugs and crocks, pickle jars and the like. And then uh, they'd start to fire. And they would use either coal or wood, whatever is available for their uh, fuel. And I think you told me this is a sample of one that has been fired. This has been fired once. You can see it's, it's harder. Oh. Yet uh, it's still porous. If we put water in it, it would just leak right through in, in, uh, in no time at all. So this has to be fired again and glazed? This has to be glazed a second time. Well, how uh, is this glazed now? What do you do to glaze it? Well, the glaze, the purpose of the glaze is, of course, to make it waterproof so that you can put liquids and uh, it's easy to wash, keep clean and the like, and it can store and preserve pickles and the like. Yeah. Uh, so they have to have a surface on here that, that's uh, tight and, and uh, a surface that, that's easy to clean. So they have to put a glaze, and a glaze you might think of as a, a mixture of glass and clay. And this has been uh, glass in the form maybe of sand, which is ground up very, very fine and then mixed together and made into a big slip, just like our clay. Oh, just a thin, thin clay. Just a thin clay with, with a lot of glass in it, and then mm -hmm. they have a big, big bucket of it, and we just take it right here and, and dip it down in, yeah. into the, the vat, and it would come up, and wherever it would, would uh, touch, of course, it would be absorbed by the, the porous uh, clay, and then mm -hmm. when they pull it out there, it would be glazed. Then that, that has to be put then in the kiln again. Then it has to be fired again because you see this, it'll have to melt. And, uh, and then it will look like this. That's right. Once, uh, once that surface melts, then it'll be just as smooth as glass on the surface of it. You can see here the shiny marks. That, mm -hmm. And it's changed quite a bit from the surface that we see on this. It's, it's yeah. dull. And it not only has a shine, but it is also waterproof now. That's right. Inside and out. Inside and out. Mm -hmm. well, Let's take a look at our other jug over there. That's a little different. One with the cob in it? Yeah. All right. Now this, as you can see, they had two, two kinds of glazes. One, this white glaze that we see on this part. And this, of course, is quite traditional, this combination of, of the brown and the white. And they yep. had a white glaze. They'd dip, dip the pot in down in this way, down to here. Then they'd take it upside down and dip it into a brown glaze. And that brown glaze would be kind of like a... a a clay that had a lot of iron in it. You know that when iron rusts, it turns a kind of a brown orange. You yeah. know? And that's why this part is, is this brown color, which I'm sure everyone has seen jugs of this sort, this part white. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you, Mr. Finnegan. That was most interesting. Wasn't it, boys and girls? Oh, let's see. I think maybe we'll have time for one cartoon. I want you to remember the time that these jugs were used. See, we don't use jugs much anymore nowadays. But this is the kind of a jug that Mr. Finnegan made for us there. And the handle. Now, what kind of people use jugs like this? Well, let me show you. The pioneer type use these jugs like this. Here are the glasses, you see. And here is the man with a beard. Pioneer type, and the ears, and the hair. That's the jug head, I mean the jug user, of many, many years ago. Next week, we are going to Springbrook State Park. Until then, goodbye. Today, your teacher has been Herb Hake of Iowa State Teachers College. Landmarks in Iowa History is produced for Iowa TV School Time by WOY TV in association with Iowa State Teachers College. TV School Time is presented daily, Monday through Friday at 1.30 p.m. by the Iowa Joint Committee for Educational Television.